Tara Brabazon, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our special podcast today. I'm just about to leave the University of Brighton, and whenever we move through these career transitions, it often is the moment where we start to reflect on prior practice and process. But I thought in this moment of reflection that I would share a series of sessions with the podcasting community. At the University of Brighton, I taught nine courses, but one of those courses was titled Practicing Media Research. Four of the sessions that I conducted, I thought I might share with you on this podcast series. This was a very unusual course. It was taught in a completely online fashion at a master's level for students that may have had no experience with any form of methods and research methods at all. So for those of you who are listening, this session may be of use for upper level undergraduates, for coursework or research master students, or just to provide a little refresher course for doctoral students as well. For faculty members, these sessions may be useful pulling out two minutes, one minute, a single idea and applying it in that way, either in a lecture theatre or as an open educational resource. So here is the first session that is an introduction to research methods. Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Professor of Media Studies at the University of Brighton and I'm also the course coordinator of your Master of Arts Creative Media. It's my task to be taking you through some of our sessions in practicing media research, your mandatory module in the MA Creative Media. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this, our first session, where we probe the what, the why and the how of media research methods. But first, let me tell you what I really think. I believe (laughs) that there's been way too much talk and emphasis on methods in research to the detriment of the theories and the actual research. We're so busy discussing the method, the how of research, that we lose the theory, the why of research. Now, I've been doing a lot of marking of research from honours dissertations through to master's and PhD theses, and I've seen way too many chapters wasted on what are quite basic discussions of method, the how of research. Now, this has been particularly evident in the United Kingdom, and less so in Australia, America, Canada, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. But there is an explanation for this difference. We're very much living in a conservative age in the United Kingdom, and I'm not using that word conservative politically. Well, not really, but in terms of the intellectual and social conversations that are possible right now. Since Margaret Thatcher's prime ministership, there's been little radical or dangerous debate over ideas. Before her election in 1979, there were intense conflicts about Marxism, about feminism, about modernity, about post-colonialism. But after the end of the Cold War, the decline of Marxism, the emergence of anti-feminism and post-feminist movements, there was an intense, honest and tough discussion of ideas that just drained away. The tough discussions seemed no longer possible or fashionable. There was basically very little space to be a rat bag. Research has become serious, and the parameters of debates have flattened. The scientists have won. The victory of empiricism and positivism means that methods matter a lot. Similarly, as more and more research has been funded by corporations and research councils and the scholarly monograph has declined, independence in scholarship, independence in thought, are more difficult to develop. There's no place for an E.P. Thompson or an A.J.P. Taylor to offer unpopular, dissenting arguments to a reticent body politic. Certainly radical ideas exist, but often they originate and circulate outside of universities, in community media and in progressivist radio and podcasting networks. The cliché of he who pays the piper calls the tune has profound consequences for scholarship in terms of the choice of topics, the questions addressed, and how and where this research is disseminated. 
So in such an environment, when questions about the why of research, the why of education, can't be asked or answered without some discomfort, it's really no surprise that there's a turn to banal and basic method. The emotion, the passion is drained away. So how research is conducted is a much safer topic than why particular areas are studied rather than others and why particular areas are funded and not others. Therefore, in this module, Practicing Media Research, we want students to learn about methods. We have to. That's our responsibility to your education. But we also want to place media research in context. So, you'll be seeing research methods in operation by scholars in the form of application. We will not be having dry, abstract discussions of method. You see, we want you to make choices in your own scholarship. I want to make sure that through all our discussions of the how of interviewing, the how of ethnography, the how of unobtrusive research, the how of action research, that you're thinking about the why, why you are conducting research and how your work fits into the social, the economic, the political environment of your time. This is about you. Media research, and indeed research throughout the sciences and the humanities, is situated on a continuum rather than through a series of binary oppositions. The continuum of methods spans the qualitative and the quantitative, the subjective to the objective, desk research to field research. But I think too often these terms are framed as binary oppositions. So qualitative versus quantitative, subjective versus object, desk versus field. But in practice, most scholars move between these categories and between these approaches. But you learn much about a researcher through the methods that they choose. A choice of methods is often a choice about results. A choice of methods is a choice about the theories and ideas that will not be talked about. If scholars choose focus groups or surveys, then questions of representative sampling become important. If a scholar enacts ethnography, then their role as an insider or an outsider of the environment they're observing becomes important. For scholars conducting archival research, the issue of what is not in the archive, what has not survived into the present from the past, becomes the most important node of discussion. So, to be simplistic, a choice of methods is a choice about what results will not be found. Media studies is an interdisciplinary paradigm. It creates productive dialogues between the humanities and the social sciences. A range of sources, a range of methods are available to us. The question is how we design, how we conduct valid and reliable research projects, how we understand the range of information and sources available to us, and the ethics involved in that selection. Research involves us asking the why question. Why is there a war on terror? Why has social exclusion increased, or indeed the fear of social exclusion, in the last 20 years? Why has there been a rise in celebrity culture? The point of research methods is to establish a verifiable and repeatable means to link speculation and observations, theories and evidence. At its most basic, that is the point of footnotes. That's the point of other forms of referencing, to allow a checking of sources, a checking of evidence, always ensuring that your interpretation is not just opinion, but derive from logical and rational judgments about the available information. Research methods allow us to move from making casual observations to making concrete, rational and logical conclusions 
from those observations. The best of research, and indeed the best selection of research methods, permits a robust mechanism for interpretation and awareness, for example, of social complexity, historical specificity. We become aware of ethical considerations. We avoid self-fulfilling prophecies. And we have an openness to research surprises and interdisciplinarity. But we also must acknowledge how who we are inflects and informs how we research. Personal experience mediates our selection of research questions, data, and interpretation. But sensory information is never received in an undifferentiated way. We need a way, a method, to link our experience of the environment through our senses and what those experiences actually mean and how we interpret them. The excitement of research emerges when different researchers have different responses to the same data set. Differences in research, differences in research interpretation actually are not a problem. They're an exciting way to create debate about the big issues of our time. Power and the power that we hold has an effect on knowledge. Who you are has an impact on how you think about the world. Marxist theories in the 19th century offered a new way to think about inequality on the basis of class. Feminist theory in the 1970s created a new visibility, a new way to think about masculinity and femininity. Post-colonial theory that emerged after decolonization through the Second World War reconfigured national histories that were based on the exploitation of indigenous peoples. So from this introductory session here, I hope two issues are emerging. Firstly, when you propose your research question, be aware of all the other questions that are not being asked, that are excluded through your selection. You see, every proposed question cancels out a series of other research questions, so be aware of that. If I'm interested, say, in investigating the experience of the soldiers in Iraq, then I'm less interested in the experiences of pacifists or anti-war campaigners. So a choice of research question is also a choice about what you will not research. Secondly, we want you to develop a database of methods and tools that you can use to analyse the information you collect to answer your research question. Do not be worried or concerned by any of the discussions of any of the research methods in the next couple of months or so. Methods are simply a way to recognise patterns. So what I would like us to talk about in our discussion this week in our online forum is how you have formed and how you will form a research question then we can start to understand research methods, how to choose source material, how to shape your interpretations. You are reading for me this week some great pieces to get you oriented into research and indeed the many meanings of research. One reading is a chapter from Adele M's book, Researching for Television and Radio, and it shows what professional research looks like within media and popular culture. So do you notice that the discussion of methods is completely absent? Basically, the television or film researcher is given a problem to solve or a field to understand, and time is the imperative. Research must be conducted quickly and under stressful conditions. Notice that ethical considerations at the end of the chapter are mentioned. So if a radio or television producer gives you a task that you know may test ethics, or indeed you may know is unethical, how will you address that problem? The second piece you're reading for me is from Gordon Rugg and Marion Petri. It's from their book, The Unwritten Rules of PhD Research. Monitor their discussions of the selection of research questions and how evidence is summoned. 
And if anyone doubts the importance of carefully selecting a research question and the consideration of methods, well, always remember the story about the mushrooms. Do you remember it? A PhD student spent three years assessing the odd growth patterns of mushrooms in a shed. You see, they grew in two hourly cycles. All was going well. Then the student fronted his oral examination. The first question from the examiner was, Could you tell us how you excluded the central heating of the sheds from your calculations? Uncomfortable pause. End of oral examination. It is important to note that maybe, just maybe, that cyclical growth spurt in the mushrooms is the central heating turning on and off, rather than some remarkable new discovery. So what I would like you to get out of this first session is this. Think about the big issue, and maybe there's more than one, the big issues that really interest you. It may be the obesity epidemic. It may be food. It may be the Arctic monkeys and the Sheffield music industry. It could be gardening. Then let's think about how, how it is to be considered in a thoughtful and reflexive way. How will you construct a research question from within that topic? So when you start to think about the research question, Write down the issues, the approaches, the people, the places that are excluded and decented if you focus on one such research question. So right at the start, think about what you're not thinking about. Predict where you believe the strong source material may be found in already existing archives. Write down what methods, strategies and tools you'll need to activate to bring alive those sources. Then, think about if there are serious gaps in the source material, or indeed a complete lack of information in your chosen area. Ponder the best methods to intervene in the scholarly landscape, to create new sources, what methods are best suited to that creation process. And that's what we'll talk about this week. As an example from my research and how I've tussled with those questions, I've connected you up with an article I wrote, I think, a couple of years ago from the journal Entertext, based at the University of Brunel. Now, this piece was an unusual one for me. I mean, it's an unusual one for anyone. It it investigated an early morning cycling class. But to give you a sense about how a research project is chosen, how written sources and archives are used and photographic environment is used and the positioning of the researcher in the research, it's a pretty interesting piece. But I actually selected it for you to read because surprising things happened through the research process and it's the surprise I would like us to think about. I really look forward to our discussions. So every now and then, a variable, a surprise, will erupt that we've never thought of. That'll come out in our research. But it's from this unpredictable problem, the startling finding, that the best of scholarship emerges. Our job as media researchers is not to ignore the surprises, but to welcome them as an opportunity to think differently. So there we go. That is the first session, the introduction to research methods. I think a session such as that is quite useful because it continues to remind students that while the how of research is very important, it must scaffold, it must lead into the why. Thank you for joining me.